Good morning, everyone. So I would just like to, first of all, uh, introduce myself, Kathy Weimer. I am a senior fellow uh, at General Mills Bell Institute. And also my co-chair, Dr. George Fahey, who is Professor Emeritus in the Department of Animal Science at the University of Illinois, and obviously uh, a well-known and world, world expert in the area of the physiological effects of fiber. I would also like to acknowledge um, ILSI North America's um, uh, Carbohydrate Technical Committee for their support of the Vahuni Conference and also um, for this specific session. And, and Susan Cho, uh, thank you for your leadership and um, oversight in planning this, this excellent conference. To kick it off, I first have, I have to find this, uh, there we go, my disclosures. Um, and then also I'm sharing um, Patricia Williamson's disclosures, who will be part of the panel, although I haven't yet seen her. So uh, Patricia, please come on up if you're here. Um, so to kick off, we thought it would be worthwhile to just um, give a little bit of, of a discussion around how we've, how we're, where we are and where we're headed related to fiber. We know that the future is going to be defined in a new way. And obviously, from our perspective, the, the way fiber has been um, determined was based really on a structural char characteristic. And then obviously, through analytical methodologies, it was then classified as dietary fiber. And the future definition distinguishes, will now distinguish between fibers that are intact and intrinsic from those that are either extracted or synthesized. Both are defined by the structure as they have been in the past. But if they're extracted or synthesized, they must now demonstrate a physiological function. And in fact, according to FDA's new regulations, they will indeed need to demonstrate a health benefit, not just a physiological effect, in order to be called dietary fiber on the nutrition facts panel. So we kick off this session by providing a key, context key contextual information through this moderated panel discussion. So we will kick it off with um, uh, this esteemed panel, um, which um, we will have our four experts in the field representing different perspectives. And Paula Trumbull will start off with an overview of fiber as it is now defined for food labeling in the US. And then this will be followed by brief remarks from George Fahey, Joanne Slavin, and P Patricia Williamson. Each panelist will have about three to five minutes for remarks, and after that, we will have about 15 minutes for a panel interaction and Q&As. Then uh, the panel discussion will lead into the scientific presentations on health benefits of fiber, with a focus on the future benefits. So without further delay, we would like to, I would like to um, ask Paula Trumbo to come on up. And um, please note that all of the bios for the speakers are in in our uh, program, so please uh, reference that. But as you know, Paula is um, with the US FDA. Welcome, Paula. Okay, great. Thank you very much, mm -hmm. Kathy. And uh, thank you all for inviting me and Ilse for um, this particular part of the uh, symposium um, to talk about uh, the science behind um, dietary fibers. Um, so what I'm supposed to do is just give you a little brief overview uh, where we are at FDA with the f uh, dietary fibers looking into the future regarding um, research. I have a much longer talk um, <clears throat> tomorrow afternoon where I'll get into why we're doing this and, and more information beyond the definition of dietary fiber. So, but in order to make sure everyone knows what our definition is, um, it really comes from the um, Institute of Medicine definition for dietary fiber. Um, this uh, definition and IOM panel was funded by FDA uh, uh, a number of years ago to come up with a definition that went beyond just analytical methods to uh, quantify dietary fiber on the food label and assume that all those 
that amount uh, reflects a physiological effect that is beneficial to human health. So the IOM had come up with two uh, components of total dietary fiber, which is how we're requiring it on the label. And one is really your naturally occurring fibers that um, are called intact and intrinsic. Um, and um, then as well as the isolated and synthetic non-digestible carbohydrates. Both of these um, now would include um, degrees of polymerization of, of greater than two, so three or more, and we do have methods that are able to quantify this uh, now, so it was perfect timing to be able to use these newer methods. But not all fibers may need these uh, newer methods, but I'll talk about that more um, tomorrow. Um, and so, uh, following the publication of the final rule that provided this dietary fiber definition, we put out a draft guidance for industry as well as another document, but for this I'm just talking briefly, to talk about how we would um, review the science to support uh, these different non-digestible carbohydrates. And so the draft guidance is, is what I'm focusing on and some of the, the key aspects of it since we're talking about science here. And what I'm doing here is showing you some of the examples of the physiological benefits. I say examples. Uh, it could be more than this, so it's not an exclusive list. I want to make that clear. It's, they're just examples. And so some of the ones that we have uh, looked at um, are lowering of blood glucose and insulin levels, lowering of blood cholesterol levels, improving laxation and bowel function, increasing mineral absorption. There's a lot of new exciting um, studies in that area and reducing energy intake. But these are just examples that we um, would consider. And to meet the dietary fiber definition, if it is isolated or synthetic, it only needs to demonstrate uh, that it has a beneficial role in one of these physiological endpoints. So it's only one endpoint. And so when you look at our draft guidance, these are pretty um, standard questions that I think anyone would ask, whether they're reviewing a health claim, whether they're looking at dietary fiber, if they're using the competent and reliable standard. They're pretty much, the standards are very much the same. And, and as a matter of fact, they're, um, I'm, there's very few differences. But um, obviously when we're looking at a study, we're going to look at if it has um, specified the specific non-digestible carbohydrate that's been isolated or synthetic. And because we're looking at individual fibers, we want to make sure that we're looking at that fiber per se. So we need to know how much of that fiber is in there. And if there are other fibers that would happen to be in that um, intervention that's been provided such that we know that we can evaluate this particular fiber and there aren't other uh, factors that could uh, affect that outcome such as the presence of other um, non-digestible carbohydrates or other nutrients that could have an effect on the physiological um, benefit. And then um, obviously uh, looking at the physiological endpoint and um, is that specified were the study subjects healthy or do they have a disease associated with the physiological effect? This is probably the one, uh, the, the biggest comment we got to the draft guidance, so we've looked at this closely and, and, and that's the point of a draft guidance is to take that into consideration. And so we are looking at those comments closely. Um, and I'll talk about that in a few more minutes. But then another important one is did the study have an appropriate control group? We're generally looking for a negative control. So it's basically uh, the standard fiber study would be with or without the fiber included in the intervention, whether it's a parallel design or a crossover study. And so that we know that it's, uh, again, um, the particular fiber that we're looking at. And there and again, sometimes um, the control may be a combination of fibers, and so we're not able to really evaluate that. And then statistical analysis, how they were analyzed, so we're looking at um, if they are, if there is the appropriate control which needs to be there, are they doing statistical analysis with that control? Otherwise, there's no point having a control in the study. But oftentimes, um, there'll be a control, but it's not analyzed. 
And then, so these are some of the factors that we consider to determine whether we can draw conclusions from them. And once we've identified those studies that we can draw conclusions from, then we're going to look at the strength of the evidence. So we'll look at the number of studies, the number of subjects per group. In the case of fiber, it's a little bit cleaner than, say, how we review health claims, because they're all um, intervention studies. We don't have observational studies on individual fibers yet, but as uh, food composition databases are able to uh, quantify them individually in foods, then they can become part of food frequency questionnaires to do such an analysis. So then we're looking at the outcome to see if there's an effect, beneficial effect, no effect, or an adverse effect. We use um, statistical analysis. Uh, and a statistically significant um, value of P of less than 0.05 for statistical significance um, to determine whether there is an effect or not. And then um, we're looking at, with all that information, the consistency of the findings, which obviously is a major factor when you're considering the strength of the evidence. And then um, finally, we will consider the relevance uh, to the general U.S. population because the nutrition facts label is for um, the general healthy population, which would be healthy individuals at most at high risk of a chronic disease, such as we would consider individuals with hypercholesterolemia or with um, hypertension. Um, and, um, so that's what the label is for. It's for four years of age and older, the, the standard label, even though we have other labels for foods purported to be used for other subpopulations. And so we will um, uh, look at what subpopulations have been considered, um, you know, women, men, um, are they all in, um, in individuals with high blood pressure or high cholesterol or whatever, and the dose. And so obviously there are some studies that have provided large amounts, like 50 grams per day. How they do that as a study subject, I don't know, but there are some of those. And so if they all were very high levels, then we have to take pause, even though the evidence is consistent, and say, well, wait a minute, is this really relevant to what's out there in the real world when these fibers are be at, being added to these uh, foods as ingredients? So that's just uh, some of the factors that we consider when we're uh, thinking of the strength <coughs> of the evidence. There's no magic number. That's true for any standard, whether it's competent, reliable. I say that just because that's brought up recently or if it's for health claims. Um, and that's because there are a number of factors that we have to consider as part of the strength of the evidence um, to determine whether there is a health benefit or not. So I will stop there. I think that's pretty much my five minutes. And um, we can proceed. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Kathy. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to be here. And I'm happy to have a few minutes to speak about this uh, topic of physiological benefits setting the stage for our meeting. Um, the first thing we've been asked to do is go to confession and give our conflict of interest disclosures for a five-year period. I'm heavily conflicted. Uh, as you can see here, uh, I retired from the university seven years ago, so I have my own consulting company. I've finished up a few grants in the last five years. I speak occasionally. I've uh, been on advisory boards and consultants to companies and so forth, so uh, this is the uh, confession. So um, we know that uh, much of the population of the industrialized world is in real trouble as regards dietary fiber. And the 2005, 2015 Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee uh, identified fiber as a shortfall nutrient, meaning that the population is under-consuming these nutrients that are listed here relative to the IOM recommendations. So you can see five vitamins, four minerals, and dietary fiber. And uh, fiber even makes the list of nutrients of public health concern, where insufficient amounts are linked to adverse health outcomes. So that's a, a pretty sobering fact. The dietary fiber recommendations, uh, fiber intake uh, has been shown to reduce the risk of obesity, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and cancer in many studies. The USDA recommendation for fiber is 35 grams a day. The IOM adequate intake recommendations uh, published in 2002 
were 14 grams per thousand kcals. So that translates to 25 grams a day for women, 38 grams a day for men. In contrast to the recommendations, 90% of the U.S. population does not consume enough dietary fiber. Uh, the average is about 15 grams a day. And for those people that uh, are on a low carbohydrate diet because they're trying to lose weight, their fiber intake may be as low as uh, 10 grams a day. And only 8% of adults and 3% of children consumed three or uh, greater whole grain ounce equivalents per day. So again, some pretty sobering uh, facts. So here we find ourselves at the 11th Vahoney Fiber Symposium uh, with some questions that are kind of obvious. Uh, if we've been attending this meeting for many years, uh, it's natural to ask what progress have we made in this area? Sometimes it doesn't look like we make very much progress. What's the state of the art at present? How are we to improve the dismal values that we just presented here? Um, we went for many, many years without a, a definition of dietary fiber. The first uh, reference to fiber was crude fiber back in uh, 1864 by Henneberg and Stoneman, and that survived for many years. Uh, Hipsley in 53 actually used the word dietary fiber and equated that to plant cell walls, but uh, after that he didn't do very much more. Uh, Trow, Burkett, Painter, and Walker were the guys that got this uh, field kind of started, and they uh, had a definition that they changed throughout the 70s. Between 72 and 76, there were slight tweaks in the definition. And then since 2000, we've had several definitions. The serial chemist, the IOM, the Codex Alimentarius one in 2009, and the FDA one that just came out in 2016. Now, the FDA definition is the one that we're probably all most interested in, and it has some uh, key components that uh, we need to address. The non-digestible, soluble, and insoluble carbohydrates with three or greater monomeric units plus lignin. Uh, intrinsic and intact, that phrase is the, in there. Isolated carbs, synthetic carbs, and then the fact that physiological effects that benefit human health are also part of that definition. Now, there are a lot of controversial issues with regard to these definitions. Uh, if you look at the codex one, they say that fiber has to be DP greater than 10, and they let, rely on national authorities, whoever those people are, to determine if DP 3 to 9 is, is fiber. Uh, with regard to the FDA definition or the IOM, uh, intrinsic and intact is a phrase that uh, causes some people heartburn. Uh, a human health benefit is assumed, but then if you look at the, uh, some other wording in the document, non-digestible carbs that are obtained from non-food sources, such as stems, branches, trunks of trees, inedible hulls and husks, seaweed, fungus, also are not considered to be intrinsic and intact. Yet if you look at uh, some of those products, they are the gold standard for intrinsic and intact, it seems to me. So there's a debate about exactly what does that mean, intrinsic and intact. It has different meanings to different people. Isolated and synthetic, we have to have a human health benefit uh, proven to accept uh, substances of fiber. Uh, physiological effects that benefit human health, uh, basically three are accepted. Uh, Paula mentioned those, laxation, blood glucose attenuation, blood cholesterol reduction, yet there are now 10 credible physiological benefits of dietary fiber. So what's the next physiological effect that might be accepted by the regulators? What's the next one after that? I mean, this is, I think, where we need to be going because those three have been around since Burkett and Trowell. There's, they talked about that. Okay, so let's move on and try to uh, get a database on some of these others because uh, in my mind, there's no, uh, there's no question that there's some major effects of the, for those others. Why does intrinsic intact need no physiological proof of concept when isolated and synthetic needs voluminous data to be acknowledged? Uh, some people have a question about that. Then we have the age-old analytical discussion. How are you going to analyze intrinsic and intact? Is there a different method for that than there is for isolated? Are those methods different than, for, than from synthetic? Uh, where are we at on that? I see Barry McCleary here who's done, spent his life working on fiber methods and has done a great job. So, uh, but analytical is always a part of this because of the complexity of the system. One that bugs me all the time is, 
the lack of recognition of the importance of animal model data in guiding development of regulations. When in other uh, areas of human health, animal models are flourishing. And yet we don't pay any attention to animal model data. Is that the right way to go? I don't think so, but again, we have this discussion. Now, well, there's good news and bad news here. Good news, never before have we had so many choices of dietary fibers to incorporate into human foods. The companies are making a lot of great dietary fiber-like materials that uh, are very pure, that uh, uh, I think they're very safe, and I think they have uh, uh, great functionality. But the bad news is we have an identity crisis. Uh, am I a fiber? Says broccoli. Uh, wood cellulose, am I a fiber? Uh, here's Quaker rolled white oats from a picture from about the 1910s or 19s. It's been around a long time, but now is it a fiber? Uh, most of us have eaten this stuff uh, for its fiber value, but uh, is it going to be a fiber or not? Well, I don't know. Can fill in the blank with your favorite fiber be declared a fiber on the nutrition facts panel? That answer is really important for the fiber ingredient suppliers who supply their fibers to the food companies who sell products. And uh, so uh, this is a big deal to change labels. It's a big deal to put a new uh, tag on the label, okay? And so uh, there's information needed ASAP to say the least on this. So finally, the, the goals of our conference, I think, should be as any good conference to discuss and debate issues and concerns related to the role of dietary fiber in human nutrition. That's our goal. But I always like action items because nothing happens unless you have action items. So can we identify the way forward to best overcome fiber's shortfall nutrient and nutrient of public health concern status? Can we make any uh, progress on that? Can we identify tangible means of moving the dial upward on the fiber intake values? I said that we have a lot of new fibers. Why can't we get those into the system and get that value increased? I think that would really solve the public health concern problem, in part at least. And then at the Vihoni 9, uh, fiber uh, symposium number 9, we came up with the Vihoni 9. Some of you will remember that. And that's a uh, Everybody knows that ha has been here what that is. And can we do something at this meeting? That can we establish some uh, guidelines that, would, that we'll remember for the, for the next Vahoney conference? Uh, can we do something to that effect? So those are the challenges I would give us, the controversies that I hope that we'll address uh, in the next couple of days. Thank you very much. Thanks, Kathy. Uh, appreciate being here. I have two other times on the program, so uh, all of my confessions are given there. So there are almost as many as Dr. Fahey, although uh, he's a little better at consulting than I am. So, uh, <laughs> but they will be on my next two slide sets. Uh, I first want to start out by thanking uh, Dr. Chow for organizing this meeting. When somebody said this was the 11th meeting, it's kind of like having a family reunion, like who's going to do the heavy lifting? And uh, she definitely did the heavy lifting, so I really appreciate that. I know she's going to give a presentation tomorrow about the history of fiber, and uh, I just want to bring out a few of that right at the beginning here of, uh, obviously, Paula and George and I were on the uh, 2001 Fiber Committee for IOM, so I don't really have anything to disagree with anybody on this panel, so I'm not going to say anything against anybody. <laughs> I'm just going to do uh, a little bit of an introduction and thank you for coming to the meeting and being part of the fiber family. So we really are a big family of fiber people, and uh, when people say, are you a whole grains person, or hey, I thought maybe you were a soy person, a fiber is how I started, and fiber is still like my first child. So I, I love fiber the most, and that's why this meeting is very dear to me. Um, I want to acknowledge uh, uh, Susan and I worked together in Dr. Marlette's lab at the University of Wisconsin, so we were sat right across from each other for two years, and uh, at that time, we spent a ton of time trying to get protein and nitrogen out of fiber, and it got really annoying, all of the fiber analysis that we did, trying to get protein out, and a lot of it just won't get out. It's that tightly bound. So some of my learnings from uh, working in Dr. Marlette's lab, I really do appreciate, and as I've tried to uh, 
learn more about fiber, I've gone back and read some of the papers that were published back long times ago. And uh, as George had talked about too, we have we really come forward that much? We have in some areas, but the, a lot of those papers are really good. So I would, would encourage people to see that. Um, I really want to uh, kind of start out by saying, why does regulatory lead? Like, why are they first on this program, and why are all of us trying to fit into the regulatory box? Uh, you know, I'm a scientist first, so I kind of resent it. Used to really bug me. Like, what the heck? This is fiber. What, you know, just like George said, how come uh, food fiber gets a pass, and if I've isolated fiber and made it better and made it easier to get into food products, I have to jump through all these hurdles? So I think you're going to hear a lot of controversy about that. But I also need to accept a path forward, as George said as we want to make progress. So as we go forward, I don't think the barriers are impossible to get through uh, these regulations. And that uh, to be fiber, you really should have some physiological benefits. So I think the proof of uh, doing that isn't all that terrible. So I'm, I'm glad that we're getting together right at the beginning, because it is kind of the elephant in the room. People are like, oh, fiber is never going to get anywhere. We're going to take it off the label. Uh, it's really nice to have uh, lots of fiber friends here from food companies, uh, the government, uh, universities. So I welcome you, and I really do appreciate people like Barry over there who has bothered to measure fiber, because mm -hmm. I uh, that was my PhD thesis was measuring fiber. I spent like three, four years of my life trying to measure fiber, and it is thankless work. <laughs> it is like the work that only a person that likes to hit their head against the wall every day <laughs> wants to do. So thank you, Barry, for doing that. And in the end, we need to have data that's right, that on the label we want to be truthful and not misleading. So the information we give to consumers needs to be right. So I really appreciate people that are willing to measure uh, fiber for us. And I just want to say that uh, if you look at the average age of the Vahuni people, if they've been to 11 conferences, you can kind of age date them and say, hey, those people are really old. So uh, the goal is to get new people into the excitement of fiber. So when I went back in the 70s, and it's like, oh, there's this fiber hypothesis. I think we could get this one solved in like two years. It's kind of a no-brainer, right? Eat more fiber, be healthier, good, we're done, check, move on. Uh, but we're still kind of arguing that. So I really appreciate the people that are here that are new to this group, haven't been to this meeting, and I hope that you will continue to be interested in fiber and have new ideas and new, new excitement about the opportunities of what's going on in fiber and the importance of fiber in the diet. Because there's no question fiber is important, it's an important nutrient, it's important for health, it's just really hard to study and we always kind of get into the point, if you do the history of fiber, people have gotten excited about fiber and then they give up. And they're like, okay, who cares, let's move on, fiber is not important. We don't want to give up this time. I think the excitement about what's going on in the large intestine is really important for health. So uh, I appreciate all of you coming and uh, you're going to have to hear about my laxation because I actually have another talk. So, And then I'll confess to all my sins too. So thank you. Good, good morning. Um, I had looked at the schedule that may have been incorrect earlier. Um, but uh, according to my disclosures, actually, now I'm working for Cargill, but I've had a, a fair stride in the food industry, starting off my career at ADM, followed by Tate and Lyle. So I have a, a long history of supporting dietary fibers and was present at the 2009 Di uh, Vahuni Fiber Symposia that was mentioned earlier. So basically, I, I don't have any slides, but I have some comments. And coming from an ingredient supplier standpoint, there are a variety of fiber ingredients which can be used to fill this fiber gap that's been mentioned. Um, they have been designed to try to help fill that need so that they can overcome taste, texture, and functional challenges that were kind of considered in the distant past. We all kind of remember the days when people were trying to add fiber early on, and maybe it didn't have the best texture. Maybe people, consumers were like, ooh, fiber, isn't that kind of gritty or dry? Um, also, these uh, innovations have been supported by both novelties in fiber production as well as all the analytical methods that have been developed in order to understand what is a non-digestible carbohydrate and where can we find that and how do we isolate it from various foods that people maybe do not eat commonly or regularly as they should and put those into other places where they already are consuming those foods and meet them where they are. 
Fiber, in fact, is second on the list of the healthful components in consumers' minds, according to the 2017 IFIC uh, Health and Food Survey. Um, it's a nutrient of concern, which Dr. Fahey has mentioned as well. Um, analysis is definitely part of, of all of this story, and making sure that these ingredients are safe and functional is something that the food industry has taken very serious. Uh, food ingredient suppliers have a long history of supporting the research, examining the various benefits that fibers can produce. Um, in fact, some substantiation has gone so far as to show um, fiber health benefit claims, such as that for beta-glucan and lowering cholesterol. Uh, other qualified health claims, such as the most recent one for resistant starch. So compare and contrast that with other nutrients on the Nutrition Facts panel, um, where there isn't a requirement to substantiate does that nutrient do what it says? Does that protein actually lead to growth and development or muscle accrual? Um, although we, we do understand that proteins do that. No one's requiring that for it to be included on a panel. Um, I think it is uh, also important for us all to understand that there's a lot of applications right now. We're grateful for the fiber definition that they're hopeful that this will produce a greater understanding about the benefits of dietary fiber, perhaps, to consumers, and, well, and they can feel assured that this has been recognized. So if they are seeking those types of benefits from fiber, or maybe gives them more of a reason why they should be seeking this out, it'd be great. But a lot of companies, their applications teams, are waiting direction on the, the fibers that haven't been reviewed currently in the US. And this can be a problem, because there's a lot of functional ingredients that they could use, and they provide a lot of benefits and attributes to products beyond just adding dietary fiber. Help with shelf life and product stability, moisture migration. They also provide bulk. They replace calories and sugars. And so having these non-digestible carbohydrates in the food supply is very important and can help achieve a multitude of goals. And so I think it's important that we understand what these uh, future fiber functions can be, what the health benefits can be, but then also continuing to understand why it's important to keep them within the fiber definition and be able to use those products. Because even most recently, I found a product that's been uh, labeled with the new Nutrition Facts panel, although compliance has just been delayed. Um, and they include a fiber in their ingredient declaration list, yet on the Nutrition Facts panel, it lists zero grams of fiber. So I think that could be also a problem when you're looking at dietary records and understanding the matching the food labels with what people are consuming. It's going to be a problem for consumers if there's a bunch of possible fibers that are hidden now from view. So, thank you. Great. Thanks very much, Patricia. So that was our kickoff with our panel, and we do have time for um, a little moderated discussion and questions. So. Um, I would certainly open it up to the audience and actually with from the panel mm -hmm. if you have any questions for each other I would certainly uh, welcome that um, and Paula if you don't mind I'd like to start with a question for you um, if you were to um, look 10 years down the road and look back what would you say um, or maybe not even 10 years what are the things that when you started on this journey in, in evaluating the fibers um, and, and now, you know, coming up with mm -hmm. how these fibers will fit, what would you say your, maybe your biggest lessons or surprises have been in, in this process, if, you're, if you were to look back? Yeah, um, I'm going to answer that question, but I'm also want to tie in a few things. Sure. Um, so, what, what we do have out right now is a draft guidance, and the whole point of the draft guidance is to get it out there for public comments. So we got a lot of comments on things like George raised about um, intact and intrinsic, um, and what that means. I think a challenge is, and it's not uh, unusual when we're trying to take some of these reports from the IOM, is to take something that is 
very science-based, and to put it in the nutrition policy so that everything is black and white. And so I think this intact and intrinsic has been one of those where we have had this, what a number of people have called a gray area. And so that has, uh, the lesson learned, I will say, has been to, um, well, I don't know if it's a lesson, but it's, it certainly has been um, something that's been very um, challenging to us, but I think we're getting there, is to make this, whether you call it intact and intrinsic or isolated, and how that compares to, um, and synthetic and taking all those, and making that so it's black and white, so everyone will know when they need to um, demonstrate a physiological benefit and not. So we have gotten a lot of comments on the intact and intrinsic. We hear, and that, that's, that's the beauty of the comment period, because we got a level of comments at a level of detail that we did not get to the proposed rule. And so that's been very helpful for us. And so um, the challenge and lessons learned is really how to take a very complex, they're like individual nutrients with different chemical structures, and to um, pull them all together and figure out how to sort out and to package them together, um, thinking about chemical structure and so forth, and, and to take this intact and intrinsic in this IOM report and make it black and white so it will be, uh, can be implemented for uh, setting policy. Um, and so that's probably the main thing. And so, and also as you've heard, there has been an extension, just because I know I will get this question, so I'll answer it anyway. And we hope that soon in the Federal Register, the specific date will be provided to everyone. Um, but that doesn't affect how we're moving forward in reviewing these dietary fibers. Thank you. So, please, if you wouldn't mind. Would you give your name, please? Sure. Uh, my name is Ed Rogers. I'm a bottomless biochem of a small startup from Charlottesville, Virginia. My colleague, Dr. Wichelet, will be speaking tomorrow. Uh, this is primarily for Dr. Trumbo and but possibly the rest of you. And, and I don't mean to put you on the spot, but it, it may. The, um, <laughs> You mentioned in your comments, I think it was respect to the health claim, there's no magic number. But there is a magic number when it comes to the degree of polymerization, apparently. So it's, it's got to be three or more. And I'm just curious, what, why three or more? If there's a mm -hmm. non-digestible monosaccharide or disaccharide that has physiological mm -hmm. effects that are beneficial for human health, <coughs> would, you know, mm -hmm. would you consider that? Well, right now, the way the regulations are have been since 93 and are, we didn't get any comments saying otherwise, is that the definition of sugars is a mono or disaccharide. And so there's where we are meeting the definition of a sugar as a mono or disaccharide. So whether it's digestible or not, it would fit into that category. But, and we didn't get any comments to say, oh, well, we should um, extend this to a DP of less than two, and therefore you need to modify and change your definition of sugars. Uh, so that's, that's all about regulatory definitions, and um, so we have to keep those separate. Uh, but receptive to the uh, concept? Well, we just went through rulemaking on all this. We've gotten comments <laughs> many times, and so um, when there's time to, to go through rulemaking again, then, um, then that's where I think it's important for the general public and industry to bring this up to FDA. Otherwise, it's, um, we're not going to make amendments to regulations unless there's a need, need to. Okay. Thank you. Dave. Many of the NHANE studies, white flour provides a bulk of dietary fiber for a lot of Americans. And how does the dose within a serving of food play into this rule? Obviously, if you're consuming 10 grams of fiber, you have a physio demonstrated physiological effect. But if you're consuming half a gram of fiber in white bread, and that have the same claim of a beneficial physiological effect? Well, flour and bread, I mean, we pretty much said those are intact and intrinsic, so those are easy. Um, and so that's, well, that's the, so, 
Uh, those can be declared without demonstrating a beneficial physiological effect. And I think synthetic fibers are simple because they're synthesized, they have a specific chemical structure, and those that are synthesized to have a, uh, are isolated to have a specific chemical structure, such as what we reviewed already, cellulose and pectin. So it's kind of in this in between, but in terms of answering your question, um, those can be declared, the fiber in those foods, they're foods. <laughs> Gilbert Bell proposed a meeting in Washington about 12, 13 years ago um, that the food industry could dilute the energy content of the diet by adding fiber and fluid. Um, and pretty much everybody in the room poo pooed it. It was a much larger meeting than this. Um, and and I, I think he was right. And so one of the things, one of the physiological effects he showed was reducing energy intake. Mm -hmm. Clearly, if you reduce caloric density of a food, you, in theory, you should be reducing energy intake. So can a food company mm. add fiber and moisture to a product, reducing the caloric density of a slice of bread, for instance? Uh. And so I'm going to talk. I'm going to help Paul out on this yeah. one because I think that if you did a study and you showed that with your product, yes, but just theoretically on the back of a napkin, no. That would so be my. Weight loss with that, or do you just I think there are different designs they mm -hmm. would consider if you look at what they are willing to accept. So um, yeah, weight loss would be great, but I think you could look at just uh, satiety, food intake later if you had a well-designed study that with your food product uh, th that had diluted calories. Yeah, I think they would look at that and accept it. And we consider satiety, satiety as a potential mechanism for the reduced intake, but it, that may not be, you know, we, we don't know. And to look at weight loss would require a much stricter study design to ensure that the weight loss is due to that fiber per se. So that's a little bit tougher to, to demonstrate. Thank you. Dan. Good morning. Uh, Dave Gallagher, University of Minnesota, three doors down from Joanne. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I have a uh, a few things I'd like to say about animal studies. Uh, they're near and dear to my heart. I've spent most of my career doing animal studies. And uh, first point is I'd like to uh, make a plea to my colleagues uh, that do animal studies with related uh, or with dietary fiber is that I think we really need to be using realistic amounts of dietary fiber. Mm -hmm. There's been way too many animal studies where they use um, amounts of dietary fiber that are completely unattainable in a human diet. Uh, I think, however, that when you consider scaling this up to a human, you have to do so, do so in a way other than by body weight. Uh, it's now becoming, I think, really clear to more people that uh, it, you have to do something that's often referred to as elementric scaling, that is scale on an energy basis as opposed to a body weight basis. If you scale on a body weight basis, you get nonsensical results. Mm. Uh, so that's one point. Uh, the second point is that I'd be interested in the panel's comments on the uh, utility or the wisdom of using animal studies in policy type decisions. Uh, I think the board is going to perhaps uh, have similar views on that. But I'd, I'd be interested in hearing uh, how you would view animal studies uh, for those kinds of decisions. Okay, well, I'll start first. I would say um, up to this point that um, FDA for nutrition labeling has relied on human studies. Um, whether it's for health claims, we're relying on the DRIs, and the DRIs, except for the tolerable upper intake level, has always only relied on human um, studies. Um, I think Dietary Guidelines for Americans has relied only on human studies, and so that's, it's pretty much been standard practice to use human studies, except for safety uh, when looking at grass or food additive petitions or setting upper levels um, at the IOM. They have used animal studies and then try to extrapolate using an uncertainty factor from animal, animal to a human number to get an upper level. Um, uh, but uh, we typically for health claims or for any nutrition policy type of uh, decision making have relied on human studies, we have used animal studies to understand the mechanism of action. We talk about that in our health claim um, guidance, uh, which is 
somewhat similar to the fiber guidance. There are some differences. And so, yes, we will consider them for understanding the mechanism of action, but to really um, set numbers and to say uh, this is necessary to have on the food label to assist consumers in maintaining healthy dietary practices, we really need evidence from human studies. Anyone else? Uh, yeah. Hang on, Mahai. Thank well, you. I just wanted to uh, say yesterday at the meeting, we had a big discussion about animal studies and how nutritionists need to help people that are doing animal studies design them correctly. Because I, you know, the, some of the comparisons when people get into animal studies and have nutrition questions but don't know they do need to talk to people like you and George and Kelly to understand how to actually put those studies together. I also totally believe that we're only going to learn by using all the data. So regulatory only needs human studies, but science needs all these different types types of studies to get at mechanisms. So we need in vitro, we need animal studies, different animals, and otherwise we'll never learn anything. So I appreciate the comment. One thing I was impressed with recently is the uh, that replacement for PDCAS, that DI, whatever, is based on, uh, for the human protein amino acid requirements, it's all on a swine model. And they're, they're using swine very intensively to get all this information and apply that to humans. That's kind of impressive that they're doing that. And it's going to make that assessment much, much better. And so, I, well, we're on the same page with this, but I, I really do believe that uh, a lot of the animal model data are very, very useful. But your point about concentration is so correct. I mean, there are so many studies huge percentage that just have weird diets, weird doses, um, just, it's just not relevant. Well, I think, um, first of all, I want to thank the panel. I think we are at the end of our time. Um, so if you would join me in thanking this panel, I think it was a great kickoff to the sessions. Thank you. Uh, and now I believe we're going to transition to um, the scientific presentation. So um, everybody but George can can leave the pan or the stage, and we will get ready for Joanne's official talk. <laughs>